Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. This is a place where you can encounter the love of God with people that love God and love each other. And I wanna tell you right here at the beginning that my goal for us tonight, for you tonight, for myself tonight, is that we would be transformed by the love of God and that we would have five extra friends when we leave. Amen? Sound like a deal? Yeah. Amen? Come on, somebody shout me down. I feel like preaching tonight. Amen? Amen. Go ahead and jump to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. The last few weeks, we have been on a mission to bring hope. This morning was an awesome experience for me. I, I spent about an hour this morning on a FaceTime with 13 other college pastors in Tennessee, and we spent about an hour just praying, praying over our colleges, praying over our city, praying over each other. And I just left, the, I left this FaceTime just so excited about Jesus so ready to be in the presence of God. And there's a lot of stuff going on, and I'm gonna be straight with you, I did not watch the debate last night. We were here having practice. I may go back and watch it later, but I can tell you that the presence of God is gonna be a lot more enjoyable. I'm just so excited to be here tonight. Amen, there is hope here. But I left that meeting this morning just ready for life, ready to see what Jesus had in store for me today, for us today, for us tonight. So I want you to do your best to perk up a little bit and to enter into service tonight with that kind of expectancy because I believe deep in here that God has a word for us tonight, for you tonight, that could transform your everyday life. Amen? So we've been talking about hope. Tonight, um, my goal is to continue this conversation of hope with the topic of the Holy Spirit. If you've been around church for a while, you know that we, we believe in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Tonight, my goal is to sort of introduce us to the Holy Spirit. Maybe that's for the first time. Maybe you've been around church for a while, and you need to be reintroduced. In the last couple weeks, I spent some time praying. In full transparency, can I be real with you tonight? A couple weeks ago, I started praying about what it would look like for us to do a, a sermon series or spend a couple weeks talking about the Holy Spirit. And I walked right through this altar and I prayed a very convicting prayer. I said, God, I know that I have the honor of introducing some people to the Holy Spirit, but I want it to feel like I'm introducing the people to a close friend and not a distant relative. <laughs> I want to feel like I'm telling the people about this real being this person of God that is with you in every moment, that is encouraging you, that is helping you make the right decisions, that is leading you through it, that came to give power for you to fulfill the great commission. I want to speak about this Holy Spirit from a place of experience and not just like this mystical thing from outside. So if I can be honest, the last couple of days have been incredible because I prayed that prayer and you know what happened? God showed up. My prayer life has looked a little different the last couple of days and I'm so excited to share some hope tonight on the specific topic of the Holy Spirit. Turn to your neighbor and say, Holy Spirit. Title for tonight's message is Uninformed. Turn to your other neighbor and say, Uninformed. One more time, like you're wondering where in the world I'm going with this. Turn to your neighbor and say, Uninformed. <laughs> Acts chapter 1. We're going to read verse 5, and if you shout at me a little bit at the end of it, that would be totally acceptable. It says, For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Title for tonight is Uninformed. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for your church. Thank you for your people. Thank you that we get to gather in your presence tonight. Thank you that with whatever hurt we carried in, we can leave without it. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are so faithful to abide in the praises of your people. And thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here with us. So I ask right now that you would give me the right words and that you would give us the right hearts to be transformed by you tonight in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. So many of you have heard me share stories about growing up in the church, but I can remember being in seventh grade, eighth grade, and Kim Walker dropped this version of how he loves the old school Jesus culture. And some of you have heard me share this before, but I can remember being in seventh grade and laying in my bedroom floor at like three in the morning. Don't judge me, we were homeschooled. But I can remember laying in the floor at like three in the morning and I had this little crate. Some of my guitar player guys are gonna go, oh yeah, I had this little 30 watt crate solid state amp 
that had a little aux cable input on it. So I would plug that joker in and Kim Walker would take me into the glory. And I'd lay in the floor and I can remember this coming out and her singing this song and it was 11 minutes long. So you had plenty of time to bask in the glory. And I would lay in the floor and in seventh grade, I would lay in the floor and just weep because the Holy Spirit, God showed up in such a special way for a seventh grader. And over the years, I had multiple moments like this where God showed up, where God speak, would speak to me. And it would be more than just like this little moment, more than just this goosebump thing or this moment where I would wonder about God, but this encounter moment that would change the trajectory of my life. I can remember in high school, our youth pastor took us for this fall retreat, and some of you were there, but he took us on this fall retreat, and he called it Broken. And we took these coffee mugs and, and a mallet, and we smashed them on the ground. I don't think anybody got cut in the eye or anything, but I was pretty young. I wouldn't remember. So we busted these mugs up, and somebody had built this really pretty cross. And at the end of the weekend, we took all these broken pieces and we glued them to this cross. And for a couple years, we hung it up in the student center. And it was just this beautiful moment of the Holy Spirit. God can take anything, right? He can take our broken pieces. He can take our mess. And he can make it this just beautiful thing. And that weekend was such a defining moment for me because the Holy Spirit showed up. And I remember just being so lost in the presence of God in these moments. Some of the most vitally important fence post moments, right, where everything changed, where I had clarity about what I had messed up in, where I had hope for moving forward in the future, were in these key moments where I experienced a genuine encounter with the Holy Spirit. So as I said earlier, my goal tonight is to introduce you to this mystical, crazy thing. And, and for those of you that haven't grown up in a Pentecostal culture, you are hearing me talk about this and you are anxious. Ooh, and that's okay. That's okay. Take a deep breath. We're going to look at some passages of scripture. We're going to give God an opportunity to reveal himself tonight. Amen? Fair? That's all I hope for tonight, that we would give God an opportunity to reveal himself tonight. I want you to jump to Luke chapter 1. And I'm going to move around a little bit, and I'm probably going to move pretty quick. But we're going to start in Luke chapter 1. At the very beginning of the book, the author says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Basically, many have taken time to write about this craziness that's happened with this Jesus guy. Just as they were handed down to us by those who were first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Now, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you. Most excellent Theophilus. Everybody say Theophilus. I just wanted to hear you say it. So that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So what's happening in the Gospel of Luke? There are four Gospels. What's happening in the Gospel of Luke is there is this guy named Luke, you guessed it, who was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. Well, he has heard all the things about Jesus. He is learning about this Christian faith, and he takes a hold of it wholeheartedly. Now, he grew up in Jewish customs. He knows all the Old Testament prophecies that there would be a Messiah that would show up, that would save the Israelite world, that would be a fulfillment of all these prophetic words. So this guy named Luke decides that while he has heard all these other stories, he has done his work and his due diligence, and he has heard from firsthand experience what all happened while Jesus was here. So he decides he's going to write his own account with one main purpose. He starts from Jesus' birth all the way to Jesus' crucifixion to show all the places where the Old Testament prophetic words connect to exactly what happened in Jesus' life. But what's interesting to me is he's writing it to this guy named the most excellent Theophilus. <laughs> and if you do some research, you'll find out that most scholars have absolutely no idea who Theophilus is. But he's getting these letters from this guy named Luke. And he's hearing about all the things that happened while Jesus was here. Now, for us in modern day, if Jesus showed up and started healing people with some of the crazy things that he did, there's a story where he spits in the mud and puts it on a blind man's eye and the dude sees again. If that had happened, it would have been all over social media and we all would have seen it and been talking about it and trying to figure out what's up with this crazy Jesus dude that's spitting on people's faces. We would have been desperately trying to figure out what was going on. But in these times, you either heard it by word of mouth 
or like this circumstance where Luke is writing this letter to this guy named Theophilus. Now, if you do the research and you look into it, this guy's name, Theophilus, literally means loved by God or friend of God. So there are some kind of conspiracy scholars that believe that maybe this Theophilus guy wasn't even a real dude because we legitimately have no idea who he was. But I tend to believe, like most scholars, definitely not calling myself a scholar, but I tend to believe that Luke is writing to a legitimate man that is taking all of this in and he's reading through the whole thing, deciding how he feels about this Jesus guy that he's reading about. Can you imagine what it would have been like to open this letter for the first time in front of however many people are there and first of all, you read it, and you're like, I write this to the most excellent Caleb. And you're like, wow, that's pretty, pretty big deal. But then you start reading through it, and you hear all the crazy stories. Luke continues to write about Jesus' baptism, about the miracles that took place, many crazy things that Jesus does over the story of his life. And then if you've heard the gospel story, you know that towards the end of this thing, he's crucified on a cross after living a completely sinless life. And then he raises again, defeating death, hell, and the grave. And that is the power of the gospel. That Jesus loved you so much that he leaves his throne in heaven to come to the earth, to live a perfect life, to die for you so that you may be able to live eternity in heaven with him. Amen? Amen. It's worth saying amen about. This is the good news. This is the gospel. Well, with all that being said, I want to jump to the front end of the book of Acts now. In Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 1, he says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. So right out the gate, you can put two and two together. So the same guy is now writing another letter to Theophilus. Until the day that he was taken up to heaven... After giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Now, what happens is he comes out and he says, this is the story of Jesus. These are all the things that he accomplished. Then he writes the second letter and he comes right out the gate to explain in these first couple verses. Here, let me continue on to verse 3. He says, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Now, I'm going to pause for a minute. So again, if you're Theo, I'm going to call him Theo from here on out. And some of you just pictured the Cosby show and I don't think that was the case. Theo gets the second letter. He's reading through it. He's going, okay, so you're telling me that this Jesus dude, after he rose from the grave, he showed back up. And he just starts telling these stories. He starts talking to these guys. He meets with them multiple times. And in verse 4, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So Acts is the second letter that Luke sends to Theophilus. You heard about all that Jesus did while he was here, but now hold up. Jesus rose from the grave. He actually came back and he had this conversation with these people. And he told them to wait in Jerusalem because the Holy Spirit's going to show up. You're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, for those of us that grew up in a Pentecostal church, those of us that grew up around this and you've seen kind of the operation of the gifts of the Spirit, or you've grown up in church and you've heard about these passages of Scripture, you kind of have an understanding of what I'm talking about. But can you imagine being the people that Jesus talked to in this moment. Dude rose from the dead. And he shows back up and he's just nonchalant eating dinner with you. <laughs> and he says, I want you to hang out here in Jerusalem until something happens. And you're like, okay, sure. Because John baptized with water, but I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And again, that's when everybody goes, all right, Jesus, whatever, bro. So then Jesus ascends into heaven, and this leads us to one of the most pivotal moments in the Christian faith, where almost a new era of Christianity is birthed. In Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1, there have been uh, the disciples that were there, along with 100 plus more people, there's about 120 of them, they do exactly like Jesus said. They hang out in Jerusalem, and they wait on whatever this Holy Spirit is to happen. 
in verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost came, there were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. Oh, buddy. That separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Okay. This is about the point where I picture my boy Theo going. Because again, he's heard these stories. He's got the first letter sitting over here next to him, right? He's read about all the miraculous things that Jesus has accomplished and all the crazy things. And Jesus said that was, this was going to happen, but now it's actually happened. So he's hearing the stories, kind of word of mouth is spreading. And finally, the letter's here and he's reading for himself that the Holy Spirit showed up while they were in this weird upper room and this wild scene played out where basically a tornado came through the house <laughs> And tongues of fire. <laughs> this sounds like a sci-fi movie <laughs> and a weird one at that. But tongues of fire settle on people. Now what's happening, the context of this is they're celebrating Pentecost. So you have all of these different nations represented that have come together to celebrate this holiday from different nations that speak different languages. So what seemed like this really weird thing at first ends up being an incredibly miraculous moment because the people kind of stumble out of the house speaking in other tongues. And all these people that have gathered from different regions start to realize that these people are praising God in their native language. These people that have never spoken in other languages are all of a sudden fluently praising God. So while some people start to mumble because these goobers look like they're drunk out of their mind, some of them are starting to realize the craziness of what just took place. So Peter stands up in front of everybody and he gives this sermon, right? It's almost like he retells what Luke told in the first letter. He says, no, this is what you got to understand. This isn't just some crazy thing and they sure ain't drunk. <laughs> Jesus showed up and this is all the miraculous things that he did. And this is how it fulfilled all of these prophetic words from here to here and here. And now the Holy Spirit has shown up and moved in such a wild, powerful way that can you even believe what you're seeing? 3,000 people get saved in one day. Because this radical move of the Holy Spirit takes over. Now at this point, Theophilus has got a little bit of a different viewpoint towards the situation. What started as this crazy wild thing kind of quickly sounds like this overwhelmingly productive way for people to come into the kingdom of Christ. Kingdom of God. And he's making sense of it in his head like... All of us would be. Again, I would have given anything to have been sitting here when my boy Theo was reading through this paper for the first time. You mean what happened? And then what happened? 3,000 people got baptized and saved in one day, in one moment. Now, if I'm Theophilus, I'm reading through this and my mind is kind of going to multiple places. Because this is one of the more out there things that you read in the New Testament. And there are miracles all over the place. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus himself came back from the dead. Blind people were able to see. Leopards were healed. Life change happened all over the place. But now you read this story of tongues of fire landing on people and them speaking in other tongues. So Theophilus is processing through this in his head. And here's how I think that he's, he's kind of going over it. He's saying, okay, well, I definitely believe this Jesus guy is legit. I definitely believe that this really happened because Luke has proven himself to be honest in the letters with which he writes. <laughs> so I wonder what this Holy Spirit thing is all about. Now, back in Genesis chapter 1, literally the very first verses of the Bible... It says that before everything was created, the earth was here and there was just this voidness. But it says that the Spirit of God hovered above the waters. 
So you can go back and if they are who I believe they are, Luke and Theophilus have read the Old Testament, they've heard these stories and they know that this spirit of God was evident and present at the very beginning of time. Fast forward through the Old Testament. What they would do is they take the Ark of Covenant the, the Ark of the Covenant and the holy articles, and they would put them in this special room, this holy of holies, right? This crazy inner room in the temple that only very specific priests were allowed to go into because if they went in there, it would kill whoever walked in there because the glory of God was just so strong. Well, the Bible says that when Jesus was crucified, that this massive veil that kind of contained this Holy of Holies was torn. And the song that we sang a minute ago when we sing the veil was torn and the doors fling wide, I see glory as I run inside your throne room, that's what it's referring to. That when Jesus died, this veil that separated humanity from this holy space where the glory of God abided was torn. And all of a sudden, things have changed. Now, By being covered by the blood of Jesus, we can now approach the glory of God in a whole new way. Now, we believe that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere, right? The Holy Spirit is present. In the moment that you get up and when you're sleeping, God is present. And when you invite Jesus into your heart, the Holy Spirit is present and he leads us and he guides us. But there are these special moments and we see them throughout the New Testament and I've seen them throughout my life. These special moments where the Holy Spirit decides to manifest his glory, his his presence in a special way. And you see these miraculous healings. You see these life changes happen. Now, Theophilus has gone through this process. He's thinking through, okay, the Holy Spirit was there in Genesis. I guess this is the same spirit. He's processing through this whole thing. Later on in Acts, I told you I was going to bounce around. I don't apologize because this is crazy. Later on in the book of Acts, this guy named Saul, who has been killing Christians, gets radically saved and becomes the apostle Paul. Paul goes on to evangelize all over the place, and he goes out and people get saved, and he plants multiple churches. A lot of the New Testament books that you read are letters that the apostle Paul has written to these different churches, Ephesians, Galatians, Colossians, and so on. Well, there's one um, that he writes to, actually, that he writes to the church in Corinth. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he answers a very important question. So I want to read through some of this. Starting in verse 1, he says, Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, when you were sinners, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray by mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says that Jesus be cursed. Nobody that is living by God, nobody that has the Holy Spirit is going to curse Jesus. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Now, here's where I want you to lean in. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one in the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Now, I read this passage in its entirety to say two things. One, the Holy Spirit gives these gifts to who he chooses. And all our job is is just to seek after him and ask for it. Now, the second point that I want to make is Theophilus has read through this book that Luke has written to him, both letters. And he's processed the craziness that's before him, and he's making sense of it in his head. And what I have to imagine at some point is going through his head is, was this a one-time thing? And what the Apostle Paul says here indefinitely is that the Holy Spirit gives these gifts to whoever he chooses to. And he definitely does not put a time restriction on it. We believe that this is still at work today in the church of God. We believe that the Holy Spirit changes us, (laughs) that you can get baptized in the Holy Spirit, 
that these gifts, that miraculous healings, that prophetic words, yeah, that speaking in tongues, that these things still happen, that God is still intentionally pouring out his spirit on those who request it so that the kingdom of God may grow and so that you may have an even more intimate relationship with the God of all creation. At some point, I wonder at what point in Theo's life that he started praying and asking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I wonder if there's anyone in the room that would say, this sounds a little wacky, (laughs) but if this is legit, I need it. I know that for many of us that hear about this stuff for the first time, it can seem kind of weird. That's okay. That's okay. But I also believe and have experienced firsthand that there is nothing that compares to being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And I do not apologize for sounding like an old school Pentecostal preacher when I say that we need the Holy Ghost right now more than anything and more than ever before. The depression, the doubt, the junk, the mess. You want to know how to fix that? Get filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. Step into it. I know it feels weird. I know it feels uncomfortable. But at some point, Theophilus has to make his own decision where he's going to stand with this and invite the Holy Spirit in. And tonight I want to be like Luke. I want to somewhat write this paper that says, okay, well, look, Jesus showed up and he did this, this, and this, and we believe that. And he said and declared that we would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if we believe that, we should believe this for two reasons. Your own walk with God. Let's make it three reasons. Your own walk with God, the edification of the body, the building up of the church, and the growth of the kingdom. Boldness comes along with this. Joy comes along with this. In another passage, the Apostle Paul writes about the fruit of the Spirit. And I believe they go hand in hand, and we may look at that in the next couple weeks. That the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And these things are for you and for those around you. You want it? Baptism of the Holy Spirit. There is this weirdness to this, but I promise you that there is nothing that can compare to it. So if you'll stand with me, I'm going to invite the band to come back up. A few years ago, there was this revival that happened at a church in Chattanooga. And uh, your boy was uh, not super busy during that time. And I drove back and forth from Chattanooga three or four nights a week and would stay there until way too late at night because I was so desperate to experience this. So ready to, to see what this Holy Spirit was about to give him an opportunity to come into my life. I wanted more. In seventh grade, I had experienced this craziness where the the glory of God was so evident and so present in my bedroom. (laughs) But I wanted more. I, I, I wanted to know what God had. If this was something that God had for me, I was not about to miss out on it. And there's one night in particular, I was there for this revival, and a buddy of mine was the worship pastor at the time. He had written this song that's called Wrecked. Shout out to Rob Alley. You can go check out the song. But the lyrics in the chorus are, I'm ready to be wrecked, to go deeper than before, because the way it's always been won't do it anymore. I'm ready to let go and see all my kingdoms fall. I might lose all control, but your glory's worth it all. So I'm ready to be wrecked. And I'm confident that there is still some of my snot laying in the carpet in that third row pew at this church in Chattanooga. Because I sang this song and I prayed it. And I experienced the Holy Spirit in such a way that it was one of those defining moments for me. The transformed 
transformed who I was, how I thought, the way that I handled situations and circumstances. Now, we're not here to pressure anything. We're definitely not going to try to conjure anything up. But the Bible says that God abides in the praises of his people. And after the conversation with these other pastors this morning and some of the things from this week and, and conversations with many of you in the room tonight, there is a hunger for a revival in Knoxville to see college kids saved, to see depression broken off, to see this, these kind of gifts of the spirit, miracles, healings. Yeah, speaking in tongues. We believe that when the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes over you, that there is this initial moment where you release this speaking in tongues, where God just comes over you in such a powerful way. So let me be coach for a minute. As we pray, as we worship for the next few minutes, this is between you and the Holy Spirit. I'll be down here to pray with you. Pastor Melvin and Miss Margarita are in the room. If they would like to come be a part of this, I would love for them to as well. We are here to pray with you. If you would say, Pastor, I would like to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, we would love to pray with you. And if you don't want to come down for prayer, he can show up right there in your seat. This is between you and him. So as you're praying, as we worship God, I want to encourage you, if that's you, and you would say, I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I want to encourage you to open your mouth and to praise God. Open your mouth and to praise God. And if this stuff starts happening that sounds like gibberish, roll with it. <laughs> Lean into it. Let the Holy Spirit move. Okay? Everybody take a deep breath and close your eyes. This is not just some wild, mysterious thing. This is scripture. This is what Jesus promised, that the Holy Spirit would be here and we would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, baptize us. Whew. Holy Spirit, refresh me. Holy Spirit, we don't have all this figured out and I thank you that we don't have to. <laughs> if you're watching the sermon online later, this applies to you every bit as much. In your room, in your own time, ask the Holy Spirit, fresh and anew, baptize me, Holy Spirit. I don't know what it looks like. I have no idea what this is supposed to be like, but I want more. And if this is a promise for the life of the believer, if this is going to help me, if this is going to help me get people into heaven with me, I want it. So Holy Spirit, have your way. Holy Spirit, have your way. <laughs> 